How is everyone today right before this holiday? Everybody, everybody, I see smiles and everything. I've got to fly back on a 4.30 flight to the East Coast in the midst of a storm, so you don't, yeah, I hope you feel sorry for me, but uh, in any event, my name is Mike Petro, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Committee for Economic Development, and I want to welcome you all today to the release of Boosting California's Post-Secondary Education uh, Performance. Uh, before we start the panel, just a, a, a sentence or two about CED, which is a business-led public policy organization. We're comprised of some 170 uh, business leaders, CEOs from across the country. Uh, we engage on foreign and domestic policy issues, and we have a, a, almost a 75-year history of engaging the business community in public policy. One of CED's first policy studies actually became the inspiration uh, for the Marshall Plan back in the 1940s. So we have this, this rich history. Uh, I'd say about 40% of CED's portfolio, though, is around education issues. Um, we uh, have been, uh, over the years, involved in early childhood education, uh, K through 12, and more recently, higher education. And it really came out of a concern that a lot of our trustees have about the skills gap, uh, but that there's not enough qualified workers to fill these much needed jobs uh, for the 21st century workforce. So in 2012, we released sort of the parent of this report called Boosting Post-Secondary Education Performance. And it was then that we um, engaged in conversations with the Lieutenant Governor and Lenny and folks at McKinsey and other business leaders around California about how can we make this national report fit more uh, to the challenges and um, the experiences that California is going through today. So uh, I'm going to ask Lenny, who's one of our trustees, to get up and introduce the lieutenant governor. We're going to have a panel of experts, uh, Pat Callen, who's the principal author will uh, provide some more detail about the report. Um, but uh, if I can ask Lenny, uh, the director of McKinsey and Company, to come up and, and take us from here, I, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and thanks all of you for showing up on this uh, lovely day before we all head out to a, a time, spend time with our families and friends at Thanksgiving. Um, I'm pleased to be helping make this connection today as a CED trustee, as a McKinsey partner, and as a Californian. Um, the subject of how our higher education system is performing is of extraordinary importance. When CED released this first report, the national report, we decided that the right approach to help have impact with that was to take it to the states, where the vast bulk of the investment and the innovation and the activity in terms of higher education occurs. So we released the, the report in California, and the lieutenant governor was the keynote speaker at that time. And he sat through that session, the entire session, absorbed the report, and said, I'd like to have this applied to California. And so we took the time to say, how do we actually take the kinds of thinking that were going on around the opportunity nationally and make that relevant for California? Uh, a couple of summers ago, I was, didn't have anything else to do because the Giants were out of town, and I was sitting in my backyard, and I thought it would be fun to pull out the master plan for higher education for the state of California <laughs> that was written in 1960. And I'm totally serious, I actually did this. I spent the entire day and read that master plan from cover to cover. And I would actually encourage all of you to do that. Um, you don't have to be a higher education geek. This was an incredibly aspirational and inspirational document that was written the year before I was born. I and my daughters are beneficiaries of that plan. It was masterful in its laying out the challenges facing the state and the opportunity and the importance that higher education could play. But it ended with a conclusion that I think is even more relevant today, which was this, it is clear that investing in a world-class higher education system could be a great benefit for the state of California. The question was whether the citizens of California and its civic leadership have the will to do that. And we did, and we benefited for it for 50 plus years. And so what we think is important is an opportunity to have that discussion again about what is it going to take to once again invest behind, have a world-class education system that benefits the state. 
And so today we're releasing, the CED is releasing a report at the request of the Lieutenant Governor to help frame that conversation and in particular to encourage the business community across the state to engage in that conversation. So without further ado, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, a man who you all know as uh, both having been in this city as the youngest mayor of the city in 100 years, always at the edge of what was important for the city, and now as the Lieutenant Governor of the State of California, being ahead of what's important for the State of California. So it's my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Governor of the State of California, Gavin Newsom. Thanks, Lane. Thank you. Well, first, thank you all very much for taking the time to be here, as uh, Mike noted, uh, and, and Lenny as well. We're not, it's not lost on us uh, the eve of uh, your time with your family and friends, so I'm, I'm very humbled by the number of people that turned out. Uh, let me first thank Lenny uh, for his inspiration and making this happen. Had it not been for Lenny's connection to CED, to Mike and Pat, uh, we would never have been afforded the opportunity to ask a question. My mom used to always say, the answer is no unless you ask. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing in life to consider. The answer is no unless you ask. So it was nice to hear yes when I asked. Uh, had I never asked, it would have been no. And uh, we are here today, a year later, with a report that's organized around California's unique needs and aspirations and, uh, and recommendations and, and an organized uh, framework that we hope to advance over the next year, which we'll get to in a minute. But I want to just give you a little bit of my bias. And, you know, I, I don't hold back. And I know some get offended sometimes by what uh, they believe to be a little bit, a little bit hyperbolic commentary on the state of the world or the state of things. Uh, but I actually believe in it, what I'm about to say. And I don't think I'm overstating it, but I'm one person and I see the world with my set of eyes and everyone sees the world with theirs. So everyone has a good opinion. I'm not ideological about these things. I'm open to argument. I'm interested in evidence. But one thing I've come to believe fundamentally is there are three things that will dominate the discourse in our state and for that matter, our nation over the next decade. And I think most of you would agree with at least two of these. One is the issue of debt and entitlement. And that's self-evident. The discussions around deficits and debt, the wall of debt in California, issues of pension, pension reform, and the like. Number two, the issue of energy and climate change. Good people can disagree. Uh, even if you don't believe in climate change, one has to acknowledge the impact of energy as it relates to a world where more and more people are entering the middle class, a world that continues to grow its population, and the like. But the third is perhaps the most important, and it doesn't get the attention it deserves, and is the thing that's changing everything. And that's this merger of information technology and globalization. Moving as folks like Dove Simon, who wrote a wonderful book called How, and Tom Freeman, who wrote a wonderful book called That Used to Be Us, they've coined the phrase hyperconnectivity. This notion that we move from a connected world to now a hyperconnected world, where the rules have radically changed. Uh, I was just listening to Bob, who's head of the Chamber of Commerce here in San Francisco is the chair of our CSU Board of Trustees, and he reminded me of that old quote from Woody Allen. He said, 80% of life is just showing up. I was a little embarrassed to interject, but I think Woody Allen was wrong. In this world of hyperconnectivity, average is over. You're not just competing with cheap labor now, you're competing with cheap genius. Continue to do what you've done, you don't get what you got. Used to be that if you continue to do what you've done, you'll get what you've got. Used to be if you just show up, that was 80% of the secret of success. I don't think that's any longer applicable. Not in a hyper-connected world, not when the global curve has risen. In so many ways, that's the long-winded story of California and our higher education system. We're competing against ourselves. It was the world we invented, as Lenny said, in the 1960s, that now we're competing against. Success leaves clues. We're not the only game in town. We're not the only institution or this, these institutions I learned, we're not a monopoly any longer. Folks are out there able to access competitors, some cases doing even better. And I think that's really the long-winded call to arms here today. We are facing mediocrity in this state in terms of our higher education system. Blasphemy, I know. We still have the finest system of public higher education in the world. That's a fact. I don't deny that. But you may not know this. We're 26th in America in the number of young folks 
with bachelor degrees. 26. Montana is ahead of us. Not just South Dakota, but North Dakota is ahead of the state of California. Those between the ages of 24 and 35, we are now 26th in terms of bachelor degrees. The United States is faring, interestingly, slightly better as percentage. 31% of folks in this country have bachelor degrees within that age cohort. We're at 30.5. It's interesting, California, it's always been on the vanguard and leaning cutting edge. We are now even below the national average, which interestingly continues to fall. And if you look in the report, you'll see countries like Poland that are dominating the United States, Norway, the United Kingdom. I imagine most of you are saying, oh, wait, what about Singapore and Shanghai and South Korea and Finland? But I'm talking about the number of people with bachelor degrees. That's a serious crisis. I'm a business person. You may know this. I've got 17 businesses, about 700 employees. I don't think there's anything more important than this issue. I joke with folks. I know we're going to be successful with this report when my friends at the California Chamber are the only ones showing up at every single meeting demanding change, not just our students demanding we don't increase tuition or our dreamers demanding that no one else is deported. As a business person, as the chair of the Economic Development Commission in the state, you cannot have an economic development strategy without a workforce development strategy. And if there's one reason this state has outperformed traditionally in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when we were the tentpole of the American economy, it's because we out-educated all of our competitors, competitive states, and competitive nations. That is now no longer the case. We're 26. Continue to do what you've done. You won't continue down the path of mediocrity. We'll continue to slip farther and farther behind, not just the state, this nation. This is code red. In psychology, you all know this. Remember, I'll make it simple. Remember, all of you, some of you are old enough to remember what a record looks like. <laughs> and some of you are young enough to understand it better because you're playing around with those DJs and things. But think about a record. It's got predictable grooves, right? You know where it ends. You know where it begins. Just goes the grooves, the needle. You got to scratch that record. Psychology, you call that a pattern interrupt. We have got to interrupt this pattern, and we're not. I serve on the CSU Board of Trustees and the UC Board of Regents. With all due respect, we have extraordinarily talented people serving on those bodies, and you'll hear from a number of them today. We really do. And we have outstanding leaders within these institutions. But we are completely captured by the way things have been done for a century, century and a half. It's so predictable. We're playing in the margins. I heard someone say, thank God for Prop 30, and it passed. And part of me, quietly, I didn't say this publicly, because God forbid I'm ever quoted saying what I'm about to say. <laughs> but I thought, boy, that was one of the worst things that happened. Because we were really close to making some really interesting decisions. But now, we're just putting that full ante of the status quo back on the table just hoping, we just passed at the UC Board of Regents a budget, just hoping the governor gives us a little bit more money because, well, we passed a budget assuming he's going to give us a little bit more money. Playing in the margins, a little more access, no tuition, sprinkle a little dollar or two for faculty, just become more in the meeting, just, right, just keep going. In a world that's changing like that, we're going through the greatest transformation in our lifetimes. The industrial economy is run out of steam. It's an atrophy. It's failing everywhere. I remember sitting here at the Commonwealth Club. I had just become mayor, and I remember Phil Bronstein, the San Francisco Chronicle up here, and someone said, hey, Phil, what about this guy, Craig? And he goes, Craig? He goes, oh, yeah, you know, Craig, the guy with the list. <laughs> and Phil said, oh, yeah, no, I, I, Craig, you know, Craig knew Mark's a friend. I, we, we got it. We got that. Well, you know, 79 newspapers in North America have gone out of business the last eight years. Phil's no longer at the Chronicle, nor the Examiner, and it's a vestige of itself. The old industrial model, broadcast news, newspapers, publishing, has radically been altered in this hyper-connected world. Seen the same thing with music. I remember a guy named Steve came along. It was great to be mayor, because I got the front row seat there in 2004, 2005, invited to Moscone Center. A guy named Steve comes up and he says, you know what, something called iTunes. Music industry was destroyed like that. Don't even reckon. That's why you don't buy albums anymore. You buy songs. 
world's customized to you, no longer standardized. The model was completely disrupted. I've got a great old uncle. He passed away a few years ago, but right now, especially now at this hour, he'd be on a second martini at the Balboa Cafe talking about the good old days. Stockbroker. So he's upset. He used to be upset because a guy named Chuck came along, screwed up his business. Used to be 109. You'd forget this. I never even knew it. It was $190 to get one share of you know, Walmart. You had no choice until Truck Schwab, discount brokerages, E-Trade, and others came along and radically changed that financial service. Now you see pink mustaches everywhere, right? Lyft and sidecar, Airbnb, the share economy, Uber comes along, a guy named Travis comes along, all of a sudden taxi industry turned upside down. The industrial economy is running out of steam. I believe we're on a collision course with the future in higher education because we have a system. It's the only comfort I would ever get if you were frozen 150 years ago and you came back. The only thing that would give you comfort would be walking back into a lecture hall at UC Berkeley. <laughs> you go, well, nothing's changed. In a world where everything is changing. So we could deny that, but we can't deny these broader trends. And so I, I want to challenge you to think about that. And that's what today is about. Number two, I think we're at peril of fooling ourselves. It used to be my mom said, work hard, get a degree, you'll be set for life. It wasn't that many years ago. She said that. Not anymore. We're still telling that to our kids, but they're smarter than us. A degree is no longer a proxy for a job. Give me a break. Used to be. No longer is. In so many ways, we educate people to unemployability. What do I mean by that? Well, we have all these degrees as an employer that I just can give a damn about. You're safe if you've got a fancy liberal arts degree. Don't get me wrong from one of these fancy universities, unquestionably. Because you can get a job in finance, consultancy. You can probably get a fancy job as a lawyer. You've got that creative thinking going. Good liberal arts education. And sure, you could probably get a job, especially out here, if a computer science degree or an engineering degree. But damn it, how about all those middle skills in the middle? How about the rest of folks? This giant conveyor belt of irrelevancy. Everyone's stuck in the middle. They've been educated in a way where they can't do that rote vocational, and they don't have the creative expertise, and they got a world where we're in a race as Tyler Cowen in his book, Average is Over, New York Times bestseller, you could pick it up around the corner, where he talks about the fact it's a race against machines, and it needs to be a race with machines, where the Gatsby curve is becoming more and more prevalent, where the middle is just getting clobbered. Again, the merger of IT and globalization, changing everything. We now have access to cheap labor, access to cheap genius, access to cheaper automation, cheaper software, access to above average robotics. Hyper-connected world. Routine jobs disappearing. It's serious. So if we're going to maintain our competitive edge, which again is what California is all about, greatness, We've got to step up and step in and have a different debate, I believe, than the debate we're having, which is how can we just get Sacramento to give us another $100 million? It ain't good enough. And I dig the debate, excuse my language, but I don't feel like I'm contributing at all in those conversations. I am wasting your time as Lieutenant Governor sitting on those boards and bodies. It is pointless. So we want to talk about broad access today. And you'll hear more from Pat what that means. UC, we wanted to get another report on UC, but every week there's a higher ed report about how great UC is and how it could be even better. We just have more money. But we really want to focus on the workforce and the backbone of education that gets forgotten, which is community colleges and our CSUs, disproportionately. And this report reflects a disproportionate frame of focus. We want to talk about relevancy with degrees. And we want to challenge all of you to think about time to degree. Who said four years? Why? 
What about learning outcomes as opposed to time sitting in a lecture hall? Why? I mean, just interesting. We want to think about real collaboration because one thing I've learned, there is no collaboration between the CSU, UC, and community college. Heck, it got so bad we were forced to collaborate, the UCs, or rather, the community college and the CSU. My friend Alex Padilla legislated a requirement on transfers, so at least we can legislatively reflect that relationship Bob, on SB what, 1440. Without that, I imagine we would be paying lip service periodically. But we also need to connect the dot to all of you. We're all in this together. It's not about Sacramento's interests. It's not just about the system's interests. It's about all of our interests. And most importantly, and this I will conclude with, the interests of a state where 76% of our entering kindergarten class this year are majority minority, 24% white, 56% Latino. And you understand, as I understand, the future of this state is our capacity for all of us to live together and advance together and prosper together across every conceivable difference. And we are failing our Latino students and African American students disproportionately. In 1960, the demographics of the state were exceptionally different than they are today. In 1960, the workforce needs were exceptionally different than they are today. So if you want to have a discussion, God bless, about just updating the master plan, there's 100 other conferences and there are 15 other reports out there. I've read them all. I want to build on the spirit of that plan to out-educate, out-compete, to provide that access and quality at extraordinarily low prices to everybody. Absolutely, that vision was valuable and it's part of our proud past. But we have to reconcile the world we're living in. And we have to reconcile that there are certain things that we can expect and certain things that we've come no longer to expect in terms of commitment from the state of California in realizing that vision. And so we have to think anew, as they say, and act anew as Lincoln said, disenthrall ourselves with the status quo. So that's my opening remarks. I will maintain much more optimism during our Q&A, and I appreciate all of you coming out. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to have our panel discussion. And Joe, are people going <laughs> to, we're not going to put them there, are we? <laughs> <laughs> I think what's going to happen is somebody's going to move this and we'll move the, the table. Okay. Are we on? Can you hear me? Yes, you're on. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm Pat Callen, and I'm pleased to have been a part of this collaboration between the Lieutenant Governor and uh, the Committee for Economic Development. Uh, I have three responsibilities here. Uh, one is to tell you a little bit about what's in the report. Uh, very briefly, because you have it in front of you, and I hope you'll take it home and read it, but just enough so we can have a, a, a bit of a conversation about it. Uh, secondly is to introduce the panel, and third is to be sure we're all out of here at 1.30. So I'll try to do um, all of those. First of all, uh, I think the Lieutenant Governor certainly captured uh, the spirit of this report in, uh, in, the rem in, in what you just heard. California is really at a crossroads, and I think the data in this report uh, supports that. We simply can't get to where we need to be in terms of the number of people that need to be have education and training beyond high school if we operate in the same boxes we have. So we're kind of at a crossroads, especially as uh, the state uh, it finds itself somewhat better off financially, and that is this also suggested by the lieutenant governor. Are we going to um, invest uh, a little bit at a time in trying to get back uh, to the status quo ante, to where we were before the bottom fell out financially? Or are we going to, yes, continue to invest, but invest in a way that leverages a, a future for higher education, which means that we will be able to provide the people of California with uh, what with, with, uh, with the uh, the uh, the education that they 
they need. So the other way in this, so this is a conversation California hasn't had, although a lot of people in this room and a lot of organizations around the state that have tried uh, to make it happen and whom we learned a great deal from. You could see the organizations that we cited in the report. So a lot of good work has been done here. Whatever California's problem is, is that it doesn't have uh, 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 smart, innovative people and organizations that have been committed to that. And yet uh, the whole has been less than the sum of the parts. And I think that's uh, the reason I, for the lieutenant governor is trying to stimulate basically a different kind of conversation, which will pull all those strains uh, 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 together. So um, the, uh, the report uh, basically simply looks at, in a sense, it's sort of a report card, not on whether California has good colleges and universities, but how well are we doing actually educating the population we have. Uh, we have two things that have to happen in higher education in California and nationally if we're to be successful. I mean, two things we have to do. One is we have to provide um, the same kind of opportunity for individuals that people who grew up in California uh, in the past have had. And when that master plan that Lenny talked about provided for many decades. Uh, so it's, uh, it is uh, 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 kind of, it's ironic or sad or whatever you want to call it that at a time when uh, education and training beyond high school, while it doesn't guarantee you anything, uh, it is a necessary, though not sufficient, condition for most jobs that get you into the middle class in this country. And California, which was a leader in the second half of the 20th century in providing those kind of opportunities for people, fell to the places that the lieutenant governor described to you, where we're not, not only not leading the world, we're not leading our nation anymore, and we're somewhat below average in most of the measures. Uh, that, uh, that we use. And so this is a, this is, people can argue about how many of this kind of jobs, good jobs, bad jobs, we're going to have in the future, but I don't know anyone would, who would argue that this is a propitious time for California to fall behind the rest of the country and the rest of the world in the proportion of its population that have uh, the skills and education associated uh, with education and training beyond high school. So we need to educate a lot more people and we need to do it a lot better because of this hugely competitive global economy that we're in. And because most of the rest of the world and some of the rest of the country followed California's leadership and started doing what we did in the 60s, in the 90s, and in the last decade. So as a consequence, they had their big education. We had ours for the baby boomers in the 60s and 70s. They made their big gains uh, in the last 15 years. So their younger workforce have benefited from this, are very well educated, are best educated in terms of the proportion of people with higher education. Uh, 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 Californians are retiring in large numbers as we speak, and the younger population is not as well educated, lags behind them and behind much of the rest of the world. So at a time when uh, both to be economically competitive and so that individuals will have opportunities uh, California uh, has, 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 uh, finds itself uh, having uh, eroded on, on both educational opportunity and, uh, and competitiveness. And this, uh, there's been great analyses of this done by the Public Policy Institute of, here in San Francisco and also by the Institute at uh, Georgetown that looks at the, at the labor force nationally and in, um, and in California. So we have a global economy. Uh, we have uh, slipped in the opportunity we're providing relative to the rest of the country uh, and the rest of the world. And in order to reach the level of education of, of people with well-educated people who can function in this, uh, in this new knowledge-based global economy, we have to, because the, uh, we have both the opportunity and the challenge, uh, to include uh, groups that were left behind in these earlier big expansions of California, but who now represent a larger portion of our population. So in the report, there's a chart that shows uh, the ethnic breakdown of Californians from the 12th grade down. And year by year, you see who, that's the future of California. And it's uh, predominantly um, ethnic groups, uh, uh, principally Hispanics, but others as well, that are with whom the education system uh, public schools and higher education serves the least well. And then we also looked at income, and the young population of California is low income, and we're prepared for their arrival if we can get them to the doors of higher education uh, by raising uh, tuition, as one of the other pieces of data shows you, for much faster than family income 
or inflation the last 20 years. It simply outstripped all other prices in the economy for a lot of that period, even healthcare in terms of the percent uh, in, uh, uh, increase, albeit on a, on a smaller base. So we have, uh, if you want to say, put ourselves in a bit of a box, which really is going to challenge the ingenuity and uh, innovation of California. And the, the final point, and if you read uh, uh, both the conclusion of the report and uh, the lieutenant governor's introduction, you'll see we can't get from here to there by simply doing better. This was, I think, the theme of lieutenant governor's remarks. We simply can't get from here to there by, uh, uh, by business as usual, by tweaks, and uh, by just, we can't tweak or spend our way to this future. We need to do a little of each, that's for sure. We need to keep investing, and we need to keep making incremental changes as we can, but that by itself won't get us there. We have to think differently about higher education. And the way I think that conversation starts, and I hope you will look at the, the story, the demographic story and whatnot, we, there, there will not be enough money uh, to do this in the conventional way. So we have to be innovative. Uh, we have to do, uh, uh, be, more, more, be, more, uh, be more effective. Thinking inside the box will only get us so far, and it won't get us to, edu to the kind of educational future that California uh, needs. So there are some things that need to be changed. We need to think about a system that focuses on, on uh, competency so that learning rather than t becomes, the, becomes the, ver the constant when it comes to giving degrees and certificates and time becomes the variable instead of the other way around the way we, uh, the way, the way we, uh, the way we tend to do it now. We need to remember that the great strength of the California system I uh, uh, that uh, 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 Lenny spent uh, 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 that time reading the master plan was uh, the distinctiveness of each of these systems and their sort of direction that each train should run on its own track. And they've done pretty well at that, and it worked pretty well for 30 or 40 years. Now the question is, can we collaborate better uh, to do better when that's sort of neither organizationally nor culturally part of the DNA of higher education uh, in this state? And yet we simply don't have the resources or the luxury uh, uh, to, uh, to continue that. If we want a different if we want a different kind, uh, uh, kind of future. So well, uh, the report is fairly forthright, as uh, was uh, Lieutenant, Governor, Lieutenant Governor in saying, we don't know exactly what this future looks like, but if we don't start a different kind of conversation and bring, different, uh, bring people to the table who have not always been, as, who represent groups that have not always been involved in this conversation, that includes uh, business to a large degree. Many individual business leaders have made enormous contributions as, as trustees and as, uh, in other ways to advisors to California higher education, but in a kind of systemic way, business has not been a big part of this conversation. So one way to start the conversation that, that, uh, that we're doing this afternoon is to bring uh, business and leaders and educational leaders uh, together and see uh, what you know, how, what their read on this. And we'd like to hear sort of what they came here prepared to say, but also I think we'd like to hear whether they think uh, the need for change is as deep or as dire as the Lieutenant Governor and the report described it. And what we got, is that right? Can we agree that this, this is a different kind of conversation that California uh, 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 needs to happen? And so um, fortunately, uh, we're going to spend our time listening to the panelists, rather, than, because you have biographies in your, uh, in your folders, and I refer you to that so we can spend our time hearing what they have to say rather than hearing me introduce them. So I'm going to, in the order that they're sitting up here, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Michelle, Bob, um, uh, Eloy, and Mo to just uh, come in and talk for about, uh, give us your sense of, uh, as I say, what you came here prepared to say, but also your reaction to what you've what you've heard and read, and uh, then we'll open it up if time permitting, uh, because I'm going to stay committed to the 1:30 adjournment. Uh, we'll open it up, and if not, the panelists of all—if we don't have a lot of time for Q&A—the panelists have all agreed to stay around a while. So if you want to engage them in conversation, you can. Sure. So, uh, hey, you got it the second time. So, uh, so first, uh, it is Christine, not Michelle. Um, I'm sorry, I, did, you know I got what? it right the second time. You know, I? I've been called worse. Didn't than I get Michelle, it right the so second that's all right. time? First time, I. <laughs> so, uh, so first, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to reserve the right to interrupt people because I think that's a lot more fun than us going back and forth in order. Um, for you, I'm just thinking about you guys. Um, <laughs> Why is it always the person that goes first that says that? But. It always is. So, I think I had a couple of reactions <clears throat> to, the, to the report, and one was 
Just looking at this as a very classic innovator's dilemma, and I definitely don't think anyone in the room needs to run out and buy the book about the innovator's dilemma, but uh, just the, the main thesis there around when you're the one who has like the big plan for education, you go out, and it is incredibly successful, and you do transform lots of people's lives with very <clears throat> effective education policy, and then 50 years later you say, huh, we've established this big thing that now we're afraid to break. And since we're afraid to break it, you know, someone else is going to come along and eat my lunch, and that's what you see in, in the private sector, right? That's IBM and Microsoft. Um, you see, uh, you know, again, many examples. It's, you know, Uber and the taxi industry. There's lots of places that occurs. And so with education, you know, it gets a little more touchy because you definitely get afraid to break the system. Now, I do have a three-year-old, so I expect this to be fixed in the next 15 years. <laughs> and a three-year-old who, at the moment, still resides in San Francisco, so there's a couple of levels of fixing I require at different stages, because um, I'm not planning to move. So, uh, so anyway, um, so number one is, uh, I don't think it's necessarily a sense of entitlement to say, oh, we're California, we should be better because we had this position and you know we're offended that we no longer have this high position on the ranking. Um, but I do believe there's an innovator's dilemma around you know this fear of breaking things. And so I had that reaction because uh, if this were again sort of more on the business side, you'd be looking at okay, how do we scale this? We have many more people that need to go to school. We have a more diverse population. How do we scale that effectively? Where scaling doesn't mean you have to throw more money at it, so you have the same price per unit. Scaling means each unit gets more inexpensive, but you're delivering the same level of service. Or, and maybe it's a different way, but you're, it's essentially like, what's the objective? If it's learning, if it's competency, fine, what are all the ways to get to competency to drive down that scale? And, and I don't necessarily assume that competency is the objective, because um, I know I had a whole reaction around, well, you know, you're not really a formed human when you're 17 or 18. Kind of takes you know, a few years to get there. But um, those are a couple of my initial reactions, so. Thanks, Bob. Well, I had a couple of things in preparing some of my thoughts, and then I look at the speaker's biography, and I was wondering why the lieutenant governor was the only one had his age uh, listed. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm, I'm certain, looking at it, he wasn't really participating much in that where were you when John F. Kennedy was shot type of thing. But um, what resonated with me in the report, um, and I'm the, the only certifiable schizophrenic on the, uh, the panel, uh, serving as the president and CEO of the San Francisco Chamber, obviously a large business organization here in the city, deeply dedicated to, to a business climate, which in San Francisco can be tough at times, and then serving on the CSU board. <clears throat> this is the first time in recent history that we've had a meaningful discussion about education that did involve billions of dollars in budget cuts. And, and frankly, that, uh, it feels a lot better right now there's a lot of optimism right now, I believe. Uh, of course, there's a lot of my colleagues that have all kinds of ideas of how to spend this surplus that uh, they're forecasting. But what resonates with me in this report, first and foremost, and I mentioned it to Lenny, because uh, the McKinsey Group put a group of uh, national higher education leaders together. It's the first time that I can remember being in the same room as the community college, the UC, and the CSU. And the breaking of the silos, uh, and as the Lieutenant Governor talked about, you know, busting things up, disrupting, what a banner idea to, to get us all together. And Lenny's offered to do that. And, and I've already mentioned it to our Chancellor, to President Napolitano and uh, Chancellor Harris. And I think there's some very, very strong interest in bringing the three systems together for a meaningful policy discussion. Uh, not revisiting the master plan, because I think that the master plan was great in its day. It, it's about all the things that Christine and, and the folks that I hear from in San Francisco, mm -hmm. because the number one issue is talent. There is no question it's the number one issue. I know that reading this report and other reports, um, that uh, we're going to be behind the times by about a million uh, BA degrees by 2000, what is it, 25. And so those are the things that, that jump out to me at most. Um, and in San Francisco, a lot of my friends who are in my industry around the country uh, are calling up to say, you know, what is it with you guys? You're the, San Francisco seems to be excelling. It's hot. 
uh, you know, what's going on out there? And of course, the lieutenant governor, when he was mayor, will talk about the Twitter tax and <laughs> the encouraging of, of, uh, of technology. But you know what's interesting? We, we had the economist, you, you probably all know him, Enrico Moretti from UC Berkeley. And he wrote a book called The Geography of Jobs. And in that book, he talks about the role that tech sector has played, not in, in only growing itself, but growing everything around it. And in San Francisco, over the last year, 7,000 tech jobs were created. But from those 7,000 tech jobs, 23,000 other professional and untrained jobs were created also. And so those are the things in reading the report, Pat, that, that I look at in my role as the, the uh, leader of the chamber to say, if we're if our mission is to foster a climate which business can operate profitably, the biggest contribution we could make is assist in providing a pipeline of that qualified talent to the workforce, to, to, the, uh, to the companies that so desperately need it. And then the last uh, observation on page 15 of the report, um, the statistic of 4.5 million adults that have some semblance of higher ed but no degree uh, Sean, tell your president, focus on that 4.5 million. Sean from San Francisco State and Sean from Bay Area Council. Uh, two different Sean's, same issue. There's a segment of population that desperately wants more, more education and is there for the pickings. And they so, get screened uh, out of jobs, too. Right. Because yeah, you notice uh, when it says attended right. as versus has a BA or BS or exactly. whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Also, that's partly a function of our low completion rates. The fact that we have so many people out there who have uh, got parts of deg you know degrees but haven't finished. So yeah, but there's a piece of this that we can control. You, you brought up right? another issue, though, that you know we, the CSU gets, I wouldn't use the word hammered. Uh, we get criticized for <laughs> the number of years it takes to complete a degree. But when you look at our profile of our student, you see that our students, by and large, have full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something that they. Um, they're not elite institutions. We take the top 33% in our population, and so it's difficult to so, get completed. So we should be system. focused on those who don't finish at all, not those who, because they have to work, take a right. longer time to finish. Yeah, I think, you know? I think there's a certain so, amount to that. And I think the community colleges would probably give, you, give much the same response. Yeah. Well, what's the business thing? It's, it's a lot uh, more effective to keep the customers you have than to go out and get a new customer. Right. So. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thank you all for, for being here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'll begin my comments uh, with uh, a quote that my former uh, partner in crime and former colleague F. King Alexander used to use all the time. He was the former president of Cal State Long Beach. Now he's an LSU tiger. <laughs> but um, he would always talk about the California Master Plan as being alive and well in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> because they've been able to take what we did well before and update it for mm -hmm. the economy of today. And they continue to adapt, and many states continue to adapt to what we started. And we still sit here looking at the same problems, dilemmas that we did 20, 30, 40 years ago, and we haven't changed. Um, so uh, let me begin by saying, um, you know, I'm a proud uh, Californian born and raised. I'm a product of the California Community College System, product of the UC system. I love this state, and this is why I do the work that I do. But as I turn to page 14 of this report, I'm reminded time and time again uh, that we have a huge problem in this state. Um, you know, I have the pleasure of being Latino, but I look at this chart and I wonder how we're going to turn the corner. Um, we are not going anywhere until we address this page. Attainment of post-secondary credentials for students of color is the future of this state. And uh, we are sitting at a point in time where we continue to talk about this. You know, the, um, I, I also have the pleasure of seeing on the board for the Campaign for College Opportunity. Our executive director is here today, Michelle. We just released a report on the state of higher education for Latinos. We're about to release a report on the state of higher education for African Americans. And of course, you know what that's going to say. And we've known what that has said for years and years and years. And now we've reached a point where it's an economic burden on this state. 
we are not going to innovate our way out of this unless we address this issue. And so we have a higher education system that continues to look at this data but does nothing to change its approach to delivering higher education to serve this population. Particularly in the California Community College System, which is the gateway. We are the gateway to um, this population, to every population, whether it be incoming freshmen from high school or adults re-entering the workforce. California Community College System is the gateway. But we have a system that disperses all accountability, uh, disperses all responsibility for its outcomes throughout a number of areas, whether it be with the faculty or administrators or the legislature. There is no central area that is responsible for the outcomes that we produce. We live in 72 independently governed districts, 112 community colleges, um, and a chancellor's office that really has no authority over me other than to tell me how I'm going to receive my funding and what compliance I have to produce. Um, we have regulated all the risk out of our community colleges. We, have, we are more regulated in this state than any other of the 50 states in the nation. We have regulated, we have issued statute after statute, bill after bill to ensure that we don't change. We have regulated all the innovation out of our system because we have, we're not able to take any risk. This year, there were only two higher education bills of any substance that reached the governor. And they were watered down, they were on the margins, one to improve the transfer associate degree process, SB 440, and one to allow my college and five others to offer extension courses like the CSU has. Both of those were, uh, received a beating on their way to the governor. There were many others. Uh, uh, Senate Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg tried to at least spur some innovation in the systems. That was beaten down. So I, I understand the argument, and I'm getting a little bit, uh, a bit cynical in my old age, but um, we keep hearing the same arguments, and we understand the data. What are we going to do different in this state to reach the results that we all need we need to reach. And I, I agree with the Lieutenant Governor. We really need to disrupt the system. Uh, and, and the people in the system, the people around the systems, have to risk their jobs every day in order to ensure that we reach the goals that we need to reach in order to be the California that we want to be. Can I ask you a question? Yes from the panel so uh so one of the things i have a company that sells to restaurants and there's a big difference for them in selling to like a chili's which is all the restaurants are corporate owned and like an applebee's where they're all franchisee owned right very different attitudes and so to the extent there's a franchisee co-op in a restaurant chain is there any sort of like franchisee co-op equivalent uh in the education system or is every is it really just every man for themselves well um as many of you know our state works in regions and so there's been a lot of discussion about regionalizing higher education. Uh, and of course, our main partners are the K-12 and the CSU. That is the bulk of our workforce. And, and so we've begun to look at that and see if we can find some, some synergies that we can uh, uh, rally around. Uh, of course, I have to give a plug to the one area in Long Beach where we have the Long Beach College Promise that is a co-op that we do share responsibility for every single student in and around the Long Beach region. Um, the, the little Hoover Commission just wrote about it, but you know, the, it can work uh, if we put the student first and not the institution first. So the question that raises, and maybe Mo would comment on this too if he dares, is to what, yeah, the, but to what extent is it reasonable to, what you're talking about is the exception, not the rule, the kind of, right. so what ex is it reasonable to expect these big statewide entities that are locked together in all sorts of different ways, more than 100 campuses in your cases, more than 20 in yours, 10 UCs. Are these the kind of, of organizations that innovate under any circumstances? That's not the only question. That's just, I thought you might yeah. touch on that. <laughs> I'll touch on that one. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, being the last speaker is good because, you know, all of the worthy points has already been covered. <laughs> and all I can say is that to the points. but. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Lieutenant Governor for taking this leadership. I think, uh, as he called it, this is a call to arms. And if you just look at after the 
Cold War, the, you know, the arms race was replaced with a, uh, with a talent race, and in that it looks like California, we, uh, uh, we declared unilateral disarmament. <laughs> so really, if you look at what has really happened, uh, you know, this is, as uh, Pat mentioned, this is the first time that in California, we're having a young generation who's less educated than their, their prior generation. And that in itself should be a major uh, red flag for, uh, for all of us in seeing what, what's really happening. Uh, you know, to mention a few other uh, related items, uh, when, we look, uh, when we look at a situation where, you know, uh, that, uh, the master plan itself, uh, and if I can correct me if I'm wrong, the master plan, even if it's title, it was set for 15 years. So I think it has been a few years beyond 15. Uh, that's the first element. Second, uh, uh, the master plan talked about uh, independent systems. I think the world is, as we're talking about a networked world, we have to move from uh, in independence to interdependence. And I, you know, to give you one example of that uh, problem is, nationally, if you look at students transferring from one university to another and one college to another, which is part of uh, the, uh, the challenges that everybody have in their lives and all of that, the amount of credit they lose is so much, is tremendous. This is very much like giving you $100 and asking you to go to different countries and exchange the money, and by the time <laughs> you'll, have, you know, you'll have $2 left. That basically is, in a way, what ha happens in students' credits. Uh, you know, <laughs> nationally, the cost of that, you know, if you look, the cost of that nationally is about $30 billion. If you look at students who go to our community colleges going to a CSU or UC, on the average they take 154 credits while, uh, for a college graduation, while uh, normally we, take, you know, we need 120 credits. Now this whole independence has gotten us to a point that we have not really recognized you know, uh, what, uh, you know, how times have really changed. Uh, I'll, if I try to use one analogy of the railroad system, and if you look at the 1800s, in the early 1800s, the city of London had seven different time zones. <laughs> what really caused it to have one time zone was the railroad, because how could you really put a, a train schedule together when you had different time zones for a city like London? In a way, when you look at, inter, you know, when you look at the mobility that we have, let's say, just, if you just look at the Bay Area itself, we have more than a dozen community colleges. We have uh, uh, three uh, CSUs. We have uh, uh, both uh, the two UCs, uh, Ber uh, Berkeley and Santa Cruz, and many privates. Just looking at all of these, if we cannot have, you know, many of our students end up going to uh, several of those ones before they can finish their bachelor's, before they can finish their uh, four-year degree, and if every time they're losing credit, because every one of us, you know, very passionately feel that our uh, math 101 is so much better than somebody else's math 101, <laughs> and it cannot transfer. How can we really get to, uh, to really, uh, to a point that we can move uh, forward? Uh, I, I think, you know, uh, and so we really have to change the, the inner working and the approach that we have really had and really move to a, uh, you know, to a competency-based model, uh, uh, the way that I'll state it if, uh, far less uh, eloquently than the Lieutenant Governor. Uh, if you continue the existing models, you know, there is no way that we can really accomplish what we have because to me this is like, the analogy is like, no matter how fast you drive your car, that will never fly. Mm -hmm. What we need is rockets and, you know, and uh, jet, uh, jet airplanes. That requires a totally different technology. That requires a totally different approach. And I think that's what higher education ne uh, uh, really needs to do. You know, going back to a few of the other key uh, challenges and, uh, and issues that we have, both in terms of the achievement gap for our underserved community, but also the students from low, uh, lowest economic, uh, economic quartile. If you look at right now in the... Uh, naturally and also within in California, uh, those who are uh, from the top economic quartile, but they have an 80% chance of having a, a four-year college degree by the time they are 25 and above. If they are from the lowest economic quartile, we're talking about 8%, one-tenth of that number. So which means that basically the, the zip code has really become a determinant factor of whether somebody is going to have a bachelor's degree or not. Now, the second element along uh, is that even within that bachelor's degree, how many of them are as relevant to the type of jobs that California has, for instance? This is based on a stock report which looked at uh, students from lowest economic quartile from uh, middle school. And, uh, he, uh, and based on that data, for every 10,000 students in the, mid in the 
uh, in the middle school from lowest economic quartile, only 770, 710 of them will have a bachelor's degree. Out of that one, only 32 is in a science, technology, engineering, and math field. So start from 10,000 and you end up with 22. Why that 32 is more important for California? Because in California, eight out of 10 jobs are science, technology, engineering, and math related. And, uh, and five out of those eight jobs are with the highest uh, salary are uh, STEM related. On top of that, one, within STEM, half of the jobs that we have in STEM related are going to be in the IT area. So what are we doing in, terms, you know, in, a, in, a, in, in this state where a, even a single computer course is not a requirement for most of our high school students? I think those are some of the you know, key, uh, uh, key issues that we have. So I think the key would, you know, we all talk about internet of everything, and maybe that will connect universities and colleges together because nothing else has really connected them together. <laughs> you, know, you know, hopefully that will be the way to do it. But I think this, it's very important that in California we really begin to look at an open educational ecosystem in the sense that we can, first of all, we look at uh, having more providers of that, uh, providers of education it's in content. Because today, in today's environment, content is free, ubiquitous, and available for everyone. Uh, so in our curriculum, just teaching content is really teaching them what happened yesterday. It's not really going to bring students and make them uh, competent in what they need for the, uh, for the workforce. How we can we really uh, move from the uh, from, the, from the content to really patterns and to really critical thinking in uh, uh, higher level uh, skills. I think that's going to be quite important. Uh, and also bring other content uh, providers and uh, entities that have content, which will include our national labs, which include corporations, which include foundations, which include uh, public broadcasting entities, which includes uh, public libraries, um, uh, uh, theaters, zoos, all of these entities, I think, uh, are uh, entities that have content. Secondly, how we can really take a lot of this uh, se separation between different segments when it's pre-K, K through 12, community colleges, uh, four-year institutions, and uh, research institutions, and then industry. Recognizing that even when the, uh, students who finish from college, by the time that they are 41, they would have gone through 10 job changes. So whatever we train them, the is going to be out of date. So how mm -hmm. can we really try to de develop a different discipline on the learning to learn model? Next, uh, when we know the fact that most of our, you know, the, most of our new jobs are going to be in entrepreneurship and innovation. I mean, this has been the state that we have been the cradle of creativity and uh, epicenter of innovation. Why is that not that part of our, the curriculum for every degree programs that we have? I think that, that really uh, yeah, needs to be looked at. And then lastly, I think if you look at California, you know, if we look at the Silicon Valley itself, one of the factors that Silicon Valley always prides itself is the innovation factor, uh, innovation factor for companies. And uh, the way practically innovation factor is defined in most companies is what was the percentage of their uh, product, the new pro uh, products that, what percentage of their revenue comes from the products they have developed in the last six quarters? And for most of the Silicon Valley companies, that ranges from about 40 to 60 percent. The challenge for higher education is how can we, what percentage of the new degree programs or new ideas and new courses that you have developed was developed in the last six quarters? <laughs> I think that really kind of tells about the status of status quo uh, that, uh, that, higher, uh, that higher education has really been. So I think though, you know, those were some of the you know, initial comments that I wanted to make, but also we should, you know, part of it we, is that we have to look at that this is an element of uh, uh, survival for California right now, in terms of what, how we, we can really uh, increase the throughput, develop new models in different systems, to what extent we, you know, we really have to make everyone go through a sidestep that everybody has to go. So it takes so many years to finish a high school, so many years to do college, so many years to, uh, do any uh, uh, internships or whatever, as someone facetiously stated, and, and uh, he, uh, here in the U.S. as a whole or in California, we have our school system is based on age segregation. If you're 10, you know, if you're 10 year old, you got to be in the, you know in the sixth grade, or if you're 12 year old in middle school and whatever. If those students who can really move faster, how can we really help them uh, to move faster? And others and concentrate more on those who can who need more help. 
and also really bring basic elements of STEM competency, not necessarily only STEM degrees, but STEM competency, which is really needed, whether somebody is majoring philosophy or music or electrical engineering, it's going to be important for each and every one of our jobs that we have in the state of California. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. Uh, other questions or comments from the panel before? Um, one of the things that uh, I was also curious about when I think you know, some of your comments were uh, making me think about, you know, how do you have these centers for innovation? And again, I have to look at this always from the context of what do I see on the business side, because that's where you know, I live every day. And some of the big companies that I introduce my startups to, um, the ones that are interested in working with startups, they're interested in doing that because they know they are not going to be the innovator in a given situation. And they say, okay, it's not our core thing. Our core thing is doing something really effectively at scale. Someone else's competency is doing it well and being innovative at the small level. How do we bring these things together? And so I think some of the large organizations that do that well will have you know, an innovation center and they might have a VP of innovation or director of innovation and so they realize they can't get everyone to agree on the changes at the same time but what they'll do is say, all right, let's have maybe a sandbox and maybe it's a center and we make decisions here before they get rolled out and we test things or maybe it's like a few locations that we try things out. Um, but they find some way to create that function. And is that something that you see any opportunities for? Is that something that we've tried um, to try to create that as a, an actual function? I think to, what, uh, to some extent, yeah, well, I can talk about San Jose State, and I think that that's happening a number of universities where they are, you know, either they have developed some degree programs, courses uh, on entrepreneurship and innovation, and also a series of, for instance, at San Jose State, we have uh, developed a series of uh, competition across the university for ideas, for projects, where it goes through some uh, some rigorous uh, mm -hmm. evaluation and those few that makes it to the top. Yeah, but what about up at this higher yeah. level where yeah, it's, um, yeah. yeah. But why are we coming to, but yeah, basically what sense we live in such a, that tyranny of status quo, that a lot of that does not uh, percolate up. Now, uh, using the, the business model, I think one of, uh, you know, one of the things that many large companies do where they, uh, they know that m many, uh, most of the innovation may happen outside their, uh, uh, mm -hmm. their company. They try to acquire in the, uh, small uh, startups and they try to uh, you know, make that as part of their organization and add to their competency. Hopefully, you know, and I'll say something blasphemous maybe for higher education, <laughs> that how about if somebody has developed an excellent course in X and we bring that one and maybe adopt that one within the university. Uh, that will be in a, an analogy of how we can bring some uh, uh, an, a startup with an innovative idea within higher education. The current models and the current uh, approaches that we have, unfortunately, does not allow that. But that basically is, would be one way to really interject a sizable amount mm -hmm. of uh, innovation in higher education. Yeah, like do te you know? I, I would love to see California do um, you know some sort of technology day or you know innovation day or whatever it is and. And you bring in someone from Khan Academy, and you bring in someone from Panorama Vacation, and they get to do their song and dance, and you have people there from, you know, a bunch of representative segments, whether it's, you know, some folks in the Long Beach system, folks in San Francisco. Um, and this is what I'm talking about, like, sort of, you have these places where you can test things out and roll them out into a system. Correct. Um, and I, I know that there are certain universities that do that, and I, I work with StartX, um, which is an accelerator program at Stanford University. And one of the things that's been really interesting is to see how they're not necessarily focused on classroom education there. It's all very practical um, and to people building real companies. But they get, uh, they get requests constantly from other universities, uh, both here and outside the US, to come to tour to find out, like, basically, where's the franchise book? Yeah. They want to yeah. come and do this program. How do we get your franchise book from StartX so we can do this at Columbia, so we can do this you know, at, uh, at Berkeley, et cetera? Um, and so uh, I would love to see some way of testing and having these, these models that are successful get replicated out. And I don't know the best way to do that. Um, I don't know how you can graph that in to you know, this public system. It seems to me if you, don't, if you change the definition of success to competency, to yeah. learning, yes. uh, Make a you're then affecting the, de you're changing the definition of operationally of quality in higher education. Yeah. As long as quality is about credit hours, yes. the qualifications of faculty right. and their publications, uh, you, it's awfully hard to, to have a, a competition for who does that best that helps students. But if you can make it a competition about 
learning, then maybe some of the ideas, I mean, I think we have a lot of innovators in California, sure. but I think we tend to isolate them very effectively mm -hmm. in pockets <laughs> of institutions where uh, they beg you not to write articles about them because they're afraid their colleagues will kill them if uh, well, anyone you know, finds To me, that's, yeah. the, that's the biggest uh, frustration uh, about sitting on a public higher ed board is the speed. Mm. I mean, just, just look at us. Every, every May, we wear these robes, caps, and gowns that were created in 10, 1088 in Bologna for <laughs> men who graduated from college. I mean, we, you know, it's easier to change the course of history than it is to change the history course. I mean, it is, it is really frustrating from, from a public policy perspective, from a person in education, uh, in business, trying to focus on, okay, what do we, what do we need to do to, to make that work? And, and I, I'm, I'm at, the, at a point now, of course, my term is ending, but um, <laughs> where the disruption, I think, is possible because people want change so quickly that you're seeing a lot of higher education competition that we didn't see in 1960. Uh, the, the profits and the for-profits and the, um, the other uh, non-profits are competing pretty handily for students that we would traditionally say were ours. Um, and I think that will help push that down a little So if you wanted to think about technology, uh, you could think about the lecture as a pre-Gutenberg technology, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. That's our favorite. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that, you know, one of the things that I, I try to bring an example that when somebody graduates and one of our graduates go and work for Intel, Google, or uh, IBM, or whomever, uh, they, are, they do not ask him this particular problem that we give you is what you covered in Physics 101 or math or whatever. They give you a problem, and all they ask, do you know it or not? You're expected, no matter what, what course you learned it, no matter what particular program you learned, or no matter some books that you picked from the library that you learned it, or whatever. It's, that's basically what we need to bring, because at the end of the day, it's going to be competency. It's, it's going to be the new set of skills that individuals need, not necessarily how many times they sat in that course and how many courses they took. And I think if we can make that shift, that and that stuff, and that's going to be a major leap, that will really bring us much closer to that competency-based system. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think you still need to have degrees attached to it, though, yeah. is going to be the yeah. Yeah, certification. Yeah. No, the yeah. certification yeah. Needs, yeah. To be, uh, needs to be done. But uh, eventually, I think we might see in this uh, industry recognized credentials that could have even far more meaning or as much meaning as degrees eventually. Uh, we have a few minutes. Would it be OK to open it up and see if anybody want to tamp down the radicalism of this panel? Uh, yeah. Yes, in the back. I, I can barely, yeah, OK. So two, two questions. Uh, the first question is the entire report, and you, you touched on the topic just a little bit. Um, the entire report does not make a distinction between STEM, liberal arts, uh, medicine, et cetera, and so forth, which I think is, is strategically uh, important to make, particular for California and particular for the US, if this country needs to have a workforce that is providing an above average return in order uh, to have the above average return in order to pay our debts back. That's a very strategic thing. Yeah. We, need to, we need to have a productive workforce in that field. Now, taking another example, and that's kind of the second question. So the first question is, why, why are we not making this distinction? And the second uh, question that I need to, need to throw out there is, a lot of what we're seeing in California right now is, is reminding me of what we had in Germany happening in the 70s when we lost uh, manufacturing jobs to, to, to Asia. And Germany at that point in the 70s, 73, 74, decided under a social liberal government to focus heavily on... He uh, on, on, on uh, secondary education, but beyond schools, which are a profit business in California, no matter what, um, largely also on the vocational training, which is entirely and utterly lacking. And a lot of the innovation that is driving German industry is happening, coming out of vocational training, and is out of, out of Facharbeiter, out of the Mittelstand, that is not uh, school-based. Innovation comes out of practically knowing things, out of people sitting in a garage and welding things together, not by sitting in a, in a school and, and, and uh, learning things that other people teach them. So the question is, why and where does vocational training show up? Well, the California Community College system is ostensibly supposed to be the place where most of this vocational training exists um, uh, in the career technical education field. Uh, 
And of course, we, we run into the same problem. We're, we're regulated on the career technical education side the same way we're regulated on the liberal arts side. Uh, you know, our faculty senates are dominated by liberal arts faculty. We, we, we do not adapt to the changing need of the workforce or of the economy, uh, so, you know, we continue to, to struggle. But, um, I mean, you know, the, the point is well taken. I mean, we, we have to build models that allow us to take uh, these individuals, give them stackable credentials, allow them to, to work in, in a field, to gain experience. I mean, if you consider, uh, we, we all have many veterans coming back right now. Um, if, if a vet who uh, happened to be um, steering, uh, piloting one of the most sophisticated nuclear submarines <laughs> that our country has produced, and this could be a 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, we give them no credit for that incredible experience. Um, and if you consider we put, you know, the future of the country in their hands, uh, but when they come back to Long Beach City College, we have no way of giving that individual some sort of credit for that experience. So there are still large gaps that we have to cover in order to get there, but, um, uh, you know, in many cases, these credentials are paying off much bigger for these students in the workforce than staying on and, and getting their uh, bachelor's degree. And with respect to your first question, I think uh, the STEM is obviously an important part of this, and it needs to be done, but it wasn't, it's not the only part, it's not the, uh, Christine was an English major, she's done okay so far. Uh, so, so I think we'll, you know, uh, with the, but that piece does need to be, be done and made a part of that, so it's not, what, but it wasn't intended to exclude it, it was just to try to make it a, a more comprehensive, comprehensive. report. Uh, yes, yes. So, I, would, could you identify yourself? Too? Yeah, I'm Sean Whalen. I'm a chief staff of President Long Beach Campus Berkeley. Um, I'm struck because it, I see a bunch of our faculty here, and it's my <laughs> uh, it's my impression in talking to faculty. Contrary to I, I think what some might think is that our faculty embrace innovation. They can't wait to do it. We have a bigger problem of trying to vet that innovation and invest in it. And so my question is, whose job is it? Because when I, when I hear about in industry, there's a vice president of innovation, I, I, I think it's safe to say that there is no such vice president at any institution in the CSU and no mm -hmm. such vice president role or vice chancellor role in the community college system. And so the question that I have is that change and innovation costs money. It, there's an investment that goes forward. And whose responsibility is that? And I noted President Oakley's comment that the legislature hasn't been the spot where really innovative stuff can get done. And without investments in the institutions then, whose job is it to help fund the kinds of really interesting ideas that could move the needle? Right. Uh, I was going to say, I, we're, we asked a question for yeah. Lieutenant Governor over here. <laughs> you, you'll get another shot That's at this question. in just a minute. <laughs> well, I mean, I can, I, the person responsible for innovation is the president of the institution. <laughs> that should, I mean, every institution has plenty of money. Yeah, but he or she's not getting graded on innovation. <laughs> That's right. And so is, where you incentives? put that money. Where yeah. are the incentives? And you described a lot of the regulatory disincentives. There are no, there are no incentives. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can tell you how it would work on, you know, again, on my side of the table. And typically what you'll see, and, and, and it's amazing uh, how pervasive this is. I mean, you pick the major brand. Is it Kraft or McDonald's or, you know, you know pick your favorite uh, one out there. They've all got an innovation practice. And, and it's specifically targeted because of all the same reasons that our, you know, state education doesn't have it. Those are the reasons it wasn't happening at local levels for these major brands um, or global brands. Um, which certainly are much larger and much more complex than you know, education in a single state in the United States. Um, and so what those organizations have done is set up a specific practice. They have a core budget that comes from the corporate level, you know, like a corporate marketing budget. They'll have a little bu corporate budget for innovation. Um, and then when you have, like, so for example, at Kraft, uh, you might have, like, Oreo cookies might say, we want to do something special. We have this problem. Is there anything our innovation practice can deliver to us to help solve this problem? And they might put a little budget in towards the innovation practice, right? They have to tie the little bit if they want to use it. Um, so, uh, and that, again, that's pretty common. Um, and, you know, depending on what organization it is, you'll have more of that funding come from the corporate level as versus from, you know, the more local or more distributed level. Um, but uh, the needle, you know, is somewhere in that continuum. Does that 
Oh. And hope I don't know if that works for us, well, but I, I think you know. as it relates to that as well, uh, Sean, um, some of the successful public-private partnerships that I've seen between universities and and companies um, have yielded, in my view, some of the best outcomes. Um, reminded of, uh, of a partnership at Monterey Bay campus with uh, uh, some of the work that they've done on ocean floor mapping, uh, the collaboration with uh, an industry that's interested in the data, um, in, in, to my respect, and not, not too much different than what the Lieutenant Governor has done with uh, Todd Rogers and what you guys are doing at uh, San Francisco State. It seems like there's, there's great opportunities. It, it's almost like you're at the, at the same stage as some of her clients where they're saying, hey, I need capital to, to do this. It's, it's almost like you're put in a position to make an ask where you see an alignment where outcomes that are produced there are good for business. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's nice about having that hub is that if you do have something happening locally, is there's a place for that to filter up to, right? That might then get turned around and distributed back out. I mean, if there's nowhere for it to go, it's always going to sit locally. I'm going to give Mo the last word here, then we're going to turn it back to Mike well, and the Lieutenant Governor. I'll go back to the, you know, the Deming's comment that 96% uh, of the issues are systemic, systemic and 4% are people. I think in <laughs> all, all of our universities, uh, and certainly I can talk about San Jose State and CSU as a whole, that we have a lot of very dedicated, very innovative faculty. They are all trying their best, especially with the, with the amount of teaching load they have, especially with the resources and whatever, and they are being very innovative. But I think the systems uh, that we have in place are such that uh, you know, it does not, it does not uh, uh, encourage innovation. It really, you know, because the, the status quo is far more dominant, and, that's the, and that basically is the reason that I think many of the things uh, do not move as fast. But as Bob mentioned, I think when we look at many of the public-private par uh, partnerships, another one is the, in the biotech industry in CSU Superb, which has, uh, includes about a dozen of the CSU universities. And the work that has been done and the, the amount of jobs that they have created and the, the amount of other, other industry, uh, biotech industry that they have brought to California has been tremendous. So we have many examples of that one uh, within the CSU that, that really talks about the great level of innovations that we have in our campuses. I'm going to close with just three comments. I think if the question you asked became the burning question that was asked in California higher education, this work uh, would have been successful, you know, uh, because it isn't the quality of people. There's something else uh, that we're not doing. Secondly, I think the point that was made early in the discussion that we, we uh, what we have certainly, what we certainly should see is a huge moral burden that we bear for not having done as well on equity issues as we certainly should have. Mm -hmm. it, we are now going to, we never paid an economic price for it. We are now going to pay an economic price if these numbers are correct. And finally, I think in, with respect to Christine's point about entitlement that she started mm -hmm. with, we, we'd be a lot better instead of asking, saying because we're California, we're entitled to be number one. <laughs> if we asked ourselves, why is this ratcheting up of education that's taking place all around the world and in some other places in our country. Why have not we been participating in that? Mm -hmm. Because we should welcome the, uh, the, the gains in mm -hmm. education that are being made around the world, but we, but we need to look to our own backyard as well. Uh, will you join me in thanking this panel for a terrific discussion? I agree with you. And let me turn this back to Mike uh, and the Lieutenant Governor. Well, thank you again. You guys jump down and don't get stuck with me. Um, thank you, all of you. Uh, I'll end as I began. Thank you for your presence. And so the, the big question, at least Thanks, that I would have at this stage is, well, now what? Uh, God help us that we wasted our time listening to the problems. We kind of already knew all the problems. So what are we going to do as opposed to the focus so often on who's to blame? So. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're thinking. About two years ago, I had the privilege of working with Lenny and McKinsey and the Brookings Institute, and we put together a statewide economic development plan. And it got a little bit of attention, and it rubbed some folks the wrong way. Did exactly what it was intended to do. Um, and we kept the pressure on with that uh, plan. And we kept the pressure on by making it actionable. We went out and worked with folks in the private sector to put together a series of regional economic development forums that culminated 
in an annual economic development summit. The first one was a little over a year ago in Santa Clara, where our co-chairs were Laura Tyson and George Schultz. Our keynote was Tom Friedman. We just finished the second annual economic development conference, regions rising together down in Southern California, and we added a co-chair, Leon Panetta. We made it a bipartisan frame, wasn't focused on the problems, it was focused on solutions. We broke down the strengths of each economic development region in the state and the weaknesses, and we are updating that economic development report and we'll be publishing it again in January. It's gotten the attention of the real doers in economic development work. It was the idea that we're not gonna wait around for Sacramento to solve all our problems. Same idea here. We wanna take this report for the purpose of dialogue and bring this report on the road and begin to connect those dots, a real collaborative, not a forced collaborative, not a nuanced collaborative, but connect these disparate parts of this body, higher education together, not just the UCs and CSUs and community colleges, but the private colleges as well. And so the idea is to bring it out on the road in regions and culminate with a summit, God bless, but a real summit uh, in the first quarter of 2015 and to make it actionable and keep the pressure on. Now, the good news is I serve on the UC Regions and CSU Board of Trustees, so I can continue to put uh, foot the, the pedal to the floor as it relates to being within the institution. It's nice to be Lieutenant Governor, at least to use the bully pulpit a little bit to keep the pressure on. But it doesn't matter what I do, it matters what you do. So we need your help. If you believe in this cause, if you believe that the challenges are deep, and we need to reconcile them. If you believe we need to do more on vocational training, and we do. If you believe we need to do more on STEAM, not just STEM, and we do. Don't forget the arts in the context of science, technology, engineering, math, that creativity index that defines, I think, the best of California. Uh, if you believe in those things, and you believe in the fate and future of the state, and think you can participate, do more, I encourage you to join this cause and this movement of sorts, and more importantly, this journey. If there's anything the reflections of JFK uh, and 50th anniversary of his death reminds us, it was probably the last time we went on a great journey together in this country. Um, and I think it's time to go back on a journey. I'm sick and tired of Northern California versus Southern California. Coastal California versus the inland California, rural versus suburban, urban, community colleges there, CSUs here, UCs here. Uh, we've got to go together. You want to go far, go together. You want to go fast, go alone. We've been running fast in all different kinds of directions, but I think the challenge requires a different kind of thinking. And journeys are not linear. They're highs and lows but we can go together. So that's the purpose of this. And let me just close, uh, and speaking of a journey, by making a case that a good friend of mine, uh, Sir Ken Robinson, made to me. He uh, came on my little TV show I had for Current TV, and we had this great conversation. He said, you remember what happened in 2004? I said, well, 2004 is a special time for me out here in San Francisco. We, we, we had some fun here, talk about journeys. And he goes, no, no, the fall of 2004. And it was context of this conversation was about leadership. He said, we're moving from command and control, the old industrial model, where leadership was selling down a vision, Sacramento selling down a vision, to a new paradigm. And here's how he described it. He said, remember in the fall of 2004, something remarkable happened in Death Valley. There were seven inches of rain that fell almost overnight. The hottest and driest place on the planet, seven inches of rain fell almost overnight in the fall of 2004. If that wasn't remarkable enough, something miraculous happened. And you may even vaguely remember this, it was national news. In the spring of 2005, Death Valley was carpeted with wildflowers. Turns out, as Ken said, Death Valley wasn't dead, it was dormant. The seeds of possibility were planted there years and years ago, waiting for the right conditions to come along. And his point was, when the right conditions come along, success becomes irresistible. So the paradigm of leadership 
in this new communication age. It's not command and control, but climate control. Create the right conditions where success becomes irresistible. So that's the framework of this effort, is to create the right conditions where we can bring people together, move away from these silos to this area of interest, and begin to solve this vexing problem that, as only California, we can and we must, because if we don't solve it, someone else will. And I love the debate we've had in California about solvency, and that bar must be low because we're all celebrating balancing a budget. But I remember growing up, and we were all talking about our greatness. So I want to move that debate from solvency back to greatness. And I am convinced this state is uniquely positioned and capable of doing that with your help. Thank you all very, very much.